Test one, two, one, two. Uh, uh, test. Yep. Thank you.
Thank you, Nadia. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on this absolutely gorgeous Sunday morning in September. My name is Sam Yoon. I'm the pastor here at San Ramon Valley United Methodist Church, where our vision is to pursue a life with God and a life with each other by following Jesus, thriving in community, and healing the world. It is so great to see each and every one of you here today. I don't know if you can tell, but the signs of fall are all around us, right? I love to see the signs of fall are all around us. The leaves are starting to change color for the parents. It's a little quieter in the house. Amen. Hallelujah. Pumpkin spice latte is back at Starbucks. I'm not a big fan of pumpkin spice latte, but to each their own. And speaking of things being back, we have the Chancel Choir and Living Water back in the house today. Welcome back to our amazing music teams. I was mentioning to the Chancel Choir that I love having them back here because when I'm preach preaching, like I feel like a force behind me. They have to look at the back of my head, but... You know, for me, it's, it's great, and I, I know for you, it, it is awesome. Today, we have such an amazing uh, worship that is planned. I'm so glad to see each and every one of you here in this beautiful sanctuary here in Alamo. So grateful for everyone that is joining online today as well. Just want to let you know, we think about you all the time. We're lifting you up in prayer, and we miss you, but grateful for your online presence I want to begin our time of worship with Psalm 47, where we read, Clap your hands, all you peoples. All you peoples. Yes. Wow. Right on cue. Clap, you, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. And it gives us a reason why. For the Lord the Most High is awesome. I hope you believe that the God that we have come to worship today, the God that has called us, the God that loves us, sees us, knows us, desires to bless us, is simply awesome. Amen? Amen. And the instruction is clap your hands, all oh, you peoples. You have permission to clap as we get into our worship today, especially as we sing as we rejoice in the presence of God, worship with everything that you have and all that you are. Friends, if you are willing and able, would you rise and share with one another the peace of Christ as we get ready to worship today? Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you, Bill. Thank you. Peace of Christ be with you. All right, folks, our voices are nice and warm, so now it is time to sing. Our opening song this morning is Love the Lord, which is in the green book, number 3116. We will also have the lyrics on screen behind us. Feel free to sing along with this one. I think you'll know it. One, two, three, four. <laughs> With all my mind, with all my strength, 
love you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and all my strength. Amen. Please be seated. I hope that is the cry of your heart today that you come to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And I want you to know that there is this God of this universe that loves you completely just as you are, no matter what may be happening in this world, no matter what you may be carrying on your heart today. Please remember, please know that God absolutely loves you. And that's a great reminder as we get into this time of community prayer. I want to just uh, remind you that, um, you know, there is a way of sharing your prayer requests with myself, uh, our prayer team, and our congregation. Uh, as you ha came into service today, uh, you receive one of these connection cards, and on the back, there is a place to share your prayer requests, and you can drop this into the offering plate as they're passed later on. Um, speaking of offering, just want to also give you a heads up. Beginning today, at the end of Nadia's amazing offertory, we will be singing the doxology. And so at that appropriate time, if you are able, please stand up and uh, sing along with that. But getting back to the prayers, it is so important that as a community of faith, as we do life with God and life with each other, that we have an opportunity to share those struggles uh, of, of our lives. And, and sometimes it's not just struggles, but it's joys. Please also share some of the great things that are happening in your life so that we can thank God with you uh, as we lift up these prayers from, from week to week. Today, uh, I want to lift up a special prayer. And I, I know there are many prayers that we need to lift up for things that are happening around the world and um, the things that are happening in our very own lives. But uh, especially this week, uh, my heart, and I think many of yours, is, is heavy, as once again we hear of another uh, shooting, uh, a gun violence at, at a school, this time uh, in Winder, Georgia, at Appalachia High School, where uh, two students and two uh, teachers were killed, um, nine wounded. Um, thankfully, they are all expected to, to get better and survive. But this is the 45th, the 45th school shooting of 2024. And our hearts break as this kind of violence continues to be present in our country. And yesterday, there was a shooting on Interstate I-75 in Kentucky, uh, wounding several people, and they are all expected to also survive the shooting. But I want to take a moment that as a community of faith, uh, we lift up prayers for the victims and the families, um, and prayers especially for, for all the students and, and teachers uh, and families um, across the nation as just this past week and the week before that, you know, kids have made their way uh, back to school. This should not be a thing that causes fear and anxiety for our young generation. Amen? Amen. And so we pray for them. We, we pray for God's peace and protection and prayers for our government leaders that there would be wisdom and that there would be real unity to enact laws, better laws, that would create a safer environment for all, but especially children and, and youth that are trying to prepare themselves for an abundant life and, and future. As we lift up these prayers, I want to read to you Psalm 91, where we, re we read, You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler 
and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield. As we remember these ancient words from thousands of years ago, a prayer that is lifted up to God for God's protection, that we would all find our lives being lived under the shelter of God's wings, let's make that our prayer and a prayer for our nation and for all those around the world today. Amen. And as you bring your own prayers, I'm going to lead us in a time of silent prayer uh, and just feel free to just express your joys, your concerns to God, uh, and then I will lead us in prayer uh, followed by the Lord's prayer. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, We thank you so much for the gift of this beautiful day. You have given each and every one of us here and those watching online another opportunity to breathe and to live into the blessing of the fullness of the day before us. And while we rest and find our refuge in the shelter of your wings in this beautiful sanctuary, or maybe at home, it is so difficult to imagine those around our country, those that are around, those that are all over the globe, who are not experiencing the same peace and safety and refuge as we are. God, our hearts break today for the things that break your heart, O oh God. And we know that as you look upon your creation, upon the world that you love so very much, that this is not the world that you want. As we lift up these prayers in agony and in pain, and yes, for some of us, with anxieties and fears and brokenness, we pray, God, that we would also be a part of the answer to the prayers that we are lifting up to you. Help us not just to be passive in our faith, Help us not just to lift up thoughts and prayers. Help us to be salt and light in this world so that however way your Holy Spirit would inspire us and move us to action, that we would be a part of your healing in this world that you love. That we would be a part of bringing forth your shalom that is spoken of throughout Scripture. In this moment, we also lift up to you the many prayers that remain deep in our hearts. There are many in our lives that we love, that are ill, that are undergoing treatments, that are suffering through so many different things, not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally, mentally. And we pray for your divine hand of healing to touch these lives, to bring forth your comfort and very presence to them. And as we intercede on behalf of the broken and those that are wounded, we pray for healing for our own hearts as well. If any of us are struggling in any way, if we're facing darkness, any sort of weight or oppression upon our souls, free us, O oh God. 
break those chains that bind us today so that, in fact, we may be able to love you, Lord, our God, with all of our heart, with all of our minds, with all of our souls, and with all of our strength. For we pray this in the most wonderful, loving, precious name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Good morning, my name is Erin Lothar, and I've been a grateful member of this church for 16 years, this congregation for 16 years, and I currently serve in the chancel choir. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And then from Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded of you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And from Acts 2, 41 through 47, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We hear with joy what the Lord says through this scripture.
Well, amen, amen. So grateful once again to have our chancel choir back and, and lead us, leading us in worship. Uh, thank you so much for that beautiful and powerful anthem. Uh, there's so much uh, in, in those lyrics, but the title, uh, Christ Has No Hands But Ours. Such a great way to get into our message this morning. Uh, let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to our hearts today. Let's pray. Lord, what we just heard, what the choir just sang, let that be the real and spiritual reality of our lives and our faith. As you bring us into a new season of ministry, as you renew our hearts today and in the days to come, May all the glory go to you. I pray that you would now fill me with your Holy Spirit so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh God. For we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, today, friends, I need to begin by letting you know I... I'm so excited. <laughs> and and I, know, I know what you're thinking right now. You're, you're thinking, Sam, when have you not been excited? You are like excited every Sunday. True, true, uh, I am. But today, I am even more excited, more than the usual, I'm excited, excited. Uh, today, I am over the top excited. Uh, and the reason is because I'm launching a, a new series, sermon series today entitled, Let Me Tell You About My Church. Let Me Tell You About My Church. All caps here, friends. All caps. Uh, this is how excited I am. Uh, for the next four weeks, uh, I'm going to be sharing with you a, a series about who we are, and who God is calling us to be. It's a series about vision and values and ultimately our discipleship strategy that will lead our church into a hopeful and fruitful future uh, together. And I also need to let you know right off the bat uh, that this series has been actually eight months in the making, eight months in the making. Uh, since January earlier this year, I have been engaged in an ongoing and monthly process uh, with the members of our church council and, and a few others uh, to pray and, and have some honest conversations about the state of our church and, and how we need to move into the future. And what you will be hearing in this series is the product of this process, something I have been calling a vision re-articulation, a vision re-articulation. And today I share with you part one in a message entitled, This is Our Aim. This is our aim. But before we actually talk about our aim, let's take a moment and um, first talk about us. Talk about us. Here's my understanding of who we are now. This is us. And, you know, give me, give me some amens here today if you agree, kind of like audience participation, don't leave me hanging up here, okay? First and foremost, this is us. We love our church. Amen? Amen? All right, good. We do. We love our church. I, I think some of us, we love our church so much, you never leave our church. I see some of you here more than I'm here in person and I keep joking with a few of you, I need to put you on payroll because you are, you are amazing and you're here all the time. And you know what? 
as pastor of this church, I am not only proud to be the pastor, I also, I love this church. There's, there's no disagreement about that. I think that's why you're here. You're here because we love our church. This is us. Also, this is us. We have a lot of good things present. Amen? Amen. 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 We do. We have a lot of good things present. Oh, my goodness. Look at this sanctuary. Look at the courtyard. Even a parking lot. You know, there are some churches in our annual conference that don't even have parking lots. They have to find street parking. And if they don't find one, they just go home. They go back home. We have music, good music, beautiful music. We have good volunteers. We have a good preacher. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Oh, man, I love these cheap affirmations. Anyways, again, no, no disagreement here. I think we're all on the same page on, on this. This is us. We have a lot of good things present. Three, this is us. We want to see growth. Amen? Of course we do. We want to see growth. Since day one of me being here, I think I've heard so many times, Sam, you need to grow this church. Really, me? Oh, my gosh, that's a lot of pressure. Yes, you need to reach younger people, more people, all people. We need to grow this church. We want to see growth. Again, no disagreement. Now, here's the last one. This is us. We've stayed relatively the same. Amen? Okay. A little bit weaker on that. And you can, you, can, you, can, you can debate me on this, but I would argue that we have stayed relatively the same. And, and, and this is kind of curious, isn't it? Because we love our church. We have a lot of good things present. We even want to see growth, but the other reality is that we've stayed relatively the same. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this quote before, incorrectly credited to Albert Einstein, that goes like this. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Not Albert Einstein, by the way. And no one really knows who first said this, but I think whoever said this, they may have been thinking about the church. Because what is true about many churches is this weird, is this weird, strange, peculiar resistance to change, to change. The prevailing thought the prevailing mantra seems to be, but we've always done it that way. We've always done it this way. How many of you heard this before in a church meeting? Amen? Yeah. How many of you are guilty of saying this in a church meeting? Oh, okay, no, none of you? Okay. How many of you, let me ask you this, how many of you have been sitting in the same pew, the very same pew, for years, maybe decades, maybe since pews were invented. Uh, Dave Coombs recently told, he's not here today, but Dave Coombs recently told me that he has never, never sat, he has, he has never not sat on this side of the church. And you know, when he told, told me that, my immediate thought was, how fun would it be if one Sunday I forced everyone to play musical pews, uh, I'll have Nadia play like the William Tell Overture, you know, then, 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 and then get everyone up, scrambling around, and when she stops, everyone has to sit where they are, and you're, you're stuck there for the rest of the service. I can already tell that no one likes this idea. All right. No one likes this idea. But the point being here, the point remains that maybe the reason we've stayed relatively the same is that we have been pretty much doing 
the same thing for years and expecting different results, but that's insanity. Uh, let, me, let me throw one more quote at you, this one from Jim Collins, the author of the New York Times bestseller, uh, Good to Great. In that book, in his book, he writes this, this profound observation that good is the enemy of great. Now, when you think about that for a moment, good is the enemy uh, of great, and he points out, uh, like, some examples like, you know, we don't have great schools, principally because we have good schools, and that few people attain great lives in large part because it is just so easy to settle for a good life. Now, for us, we have already mentioned that there are a lot of good things present in our church. There are. But could it be that not only good is the enemy of great, but that good is also the enemy of growth, of growth? As in, what we have is good enough. So why bother for more or for change? Well, the fact of the matter is, and I hate to break the news to you today if this is the first time you're hearing this, that good enough is not good enough when it comes to building up the church and expanding the kingdom of God. And especially when we look around and we see things unchanging, when we realize that we need to grow, but the people that we're trying to reach and we need to reach are not being reached, then we have to confess that good enough is not good enough when it comes to building the church and expanding the kingdom of God. And that's why... For eight months, so grateful for our church council, for our leaders, and some others to engage in this ongoing process of conver honest conversation, and ultimately having the Holy Spirit lead us to a vision rearticulation. And here's the big reveal. You've heard it already if you've been kind of paying attention in service from the beginning. Our vision is this to pursue a life with God and a life with each other by following Jesus, thriving in community, and healing the world. Healing the world. Now, friends, this is not just a good enough bar that we are setting here. These are what I call BHAGs, the big, hairy, audacious goals. It's not something that is achievable overnight, and it's certainly not something that can be attained without effort. It's going to take all of our commitment, and it's going to take all of our conviction. And I love what David Henry, uh, Henry David Thoreau wrote. He said, in the long run, men only hit what they aim at. Therefore, though they should fail immediately, they had better aim at something high. They had better aim at something high. This is our aim, to pursue a life with God and a life with each other by following Jesus, thriving in community, and healing the world. And talk about aiming high. This vision is rooted in what has been called the two greats in the New Testament, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. The Great Commandment, Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, and Jesus replied, and he's being tested by this kind of expert of the biblical law. What's the greatest commandment? There's 613. You expect me to choose one? Ha! 
you're not going to get me, Jesus says. I'm going to give you the correct answer. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. That's a high aim. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus concludes by saying all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments, 613, boiled down to two, embedded in our aim, in our vision to pursue a life with God, a life with each other. Love God, love people. That's the most important thing. And this is not just a good idea. It is a great commandment, the greatest commandment, in fact. And you see that embedded right there in our vision re-articulation. And then there's the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Jesus dies on the cross, raises from the dead on the third day, reappears to the disciples, kind of freaked them out for a moment. But then now they're on the mountain before Jesus ascends into heaven. And this is the last kind of marching orders given to those disciples and to each and every one of us, the Great Commission, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The great commandment, love God, love people, life with God, life with each other. But the great commission is go and make disciples of all nations, meaning the world, meaning go to the ends of the earth, meaning get out of our pews where we've been sitting in for decades and go and share the good news. I'll be speaking more on this next Sunday in terms of our discipleship strategy, so just hang on, come back next week to hear kind of an unveiling and an unpacking of how that's going to happen, how we're going to make disciples. But for today and the remaining time, let me just name what we, myself and and our church, elected church leaders, have discerned as our core values. These are the things that will qualify everything we do as a church. And there's not ten. We're just going to name three for now. Three core values. Number one, inclusion. Inclusion. This is the idea that we welcome seekers and doubters, friends and strangers, those with labels and those without. Meaning, literally, we welcome All, we exclude no one. This is not a church for those who are already church. This is not a church who were once Methodists and looking for a Methodist church. This is a church who wants to do life with God and life with each other. And we need to uphold this value of inclusion. And we all come from different backgrounds and walks of life and Some of us, we have lots of church experience. Some of us will walk through these doors and we'll have zero church experience. What will we do to make sure that every single person who considers this, maybe their spiritual home for their future, that they belong here, that they are welcome here, that they are loved here? I don't need to tell you that right now we live in a completely connected world by way of screens and media and internet, but socially, spiritually, we are so disconnected, are we not? That's why poll after poll lifts up the statistic that the majority of people here in the United States are so, so lonely. People are looking for belonging. And I come to understand this, you know, a long time ago. 
that you need to belong before you can believe. I think the church for years have gotten it the wrong way. Oh, believe in what we believe, and then you will belong. No. We love. We welcome. And by inclusion, I don't mean kind of like the Motel 6 mantra, we'll keep the lights on for you, right? And just wait passively. No. This biblical value of inclusion means we will keep the lights on for you, and we're going to be peering out the window, <laughs> looking for you, hungering for your presence. And I know some of you are thinking, you know, Sam, when new people come, they don't want 20 people, you know, just all kind of hoarding them, and, you know, it's kind of creepy. I would say, you know, the alternative to creepy is far worse, and that is apathetic. And I hate to say this, but there are still people who come for the very first time to worship here. And they leave not feeling included because not a single one asks them their name. This has to be a value for us if we are going to live into our aim to do life with God, life with each other by following Jesus, thriving in community and healing the world. Core value number two, inspiration. And what we mean by this is that we invite the Spirit of God to launch, to touch our hearts and transform our lives. Friends, in a world filled with so much of the opposite, discouragement, darkness, depression, destruction, I think we could use a dose of inspiration, amen? But inspiration, that doesn't just lead us to feeling good. Inspiration that leads to transformation. And as a value, as this will qualify the things that we do in the future, hopefully we will come to understand that you cannot experience an encounter with God, with a good and great God of this universe, and remain unchanged. Which, friends, implies growth. It implies growth. We come here each and every Sunday. For most of us who've been coming here for many years, we come here because we're inspired by the music. Good. Praise the Lord. We should be. We have great, awesome music. We come here hopefully to get our little fix of the word, biblical teaching, and hopefully that's inspiring too, that it's given you some food for thought, but, but also that it's touched your heart in some way. But as we begin to put all of that together and assess what is the result, we look upon ourselves and say, how have we changed? Inspiration leads to transformation. And we'll be looking at that for each and every one of ourselves as a value. Core value number three, impact. And by impact, we mean that we reach out to make a measurable difference wherever and whenever we can. It's rooted in this understanding that the church exists not for its own sake or for the sake of those who belong to it. The church exists for everyone that is outside of the church. God gathers this community of faith together to equip and empower us to go beyond the walls of this church, to make a difference out there, to impact the world out there. And Jesus told the disciples, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. You are the ones that will enact change, not just for yourself, but for the world. When we take this seriously, this is not only possible, friends, it is probable. But we need to commit to it with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our souls, and with all our strength. And I love that the picture of who God is calling us to be in our aim, our vision, our values, 
is made clear in Acts chapter 2 that Aaron read for us a little while ago. This is the description of the early church, but it is a prescription for our church today. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, and everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and, and had everything in common. And I will argue this to the last day of my ministry, whenever that will be, to the last day of my life on earth, my last breath that I take, that we don't have to figure things out. God has given us a description and a prescription. When we begin to understand what a life with God looks like and a life with each other looks like, and we follow Jesus and we thrive in community and we have our hearts oriented to healing the world, that's when the church gets on fire. And that's when we see things change. That's when lives are transformed. That's where the broken are healed. That's where those who have despaired for so long find hope. And that's where God does the thing that God can do through those who said amen to the call of God. So let me close with this. I think it was about 1997, my first appointment. I was planting a church in San Diego. I took a group of about four or five men to Chicago with me to attend this thing called the Willow Creek Leadership Summit happening in South Barrington, Illinois. At the time, Willow Creek Community Church was the largest church in the United States of America with, at that time, about 20,000 people in worship, not just, message, not, not just members, 20,000 in, in worship. And they had multiple services uh, throughout the week on Saturday evening and Sunday mornings was especially reserved to reach what they called seekers or unbelievers or unchurched people. So it wasn't the service for people like many of us. And they did such a great job. And they put on this leadership summit to teach, you know, young aspiring pastors like myself, how to do the same thing. And I was mesmerized. The campus was big. It was beautiful. The auditorium was massive. The people who spoke on the, uh, on the, on the stage were just inspiring and so articulate. And I thought to myself, this is it. This is, this is what I want to do. This is the church that I want to build. But the real inspiration came when... In one of the afternoons, our group and many groups were led on tours throughout the campus to see all the stuff that made up Willow Creek Community Church. And the group that I was in with about 20 people was led by this individual. I can't remember his name, but I know what he did for the church. He was part of the custodial team. Now, he wasn't on the clock when he was giving this tour. He was doing this as a volunteer because he was a member of Willow Creek Community Church, not just an employee. And in fact, as he was leading us in tour, he was basically telling us, let me tell you about my church. And everything was kind of like status quo, you know, this is this, this is that. And everyone's like, wow, 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 wow. And then he led us into the gym. And then at that moment, his tone changed and he said, this is my favorite place on the campus because in this gym my two children came to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord and it's by a miracle because during that time my wife and I we were uh, about to get a divorce and I was a broken man someone invited me to this church and I found hope but my kids, they were broken. They were discouraged. Their parents getting a divorce. And I pray to God that if maybe they could come to the youth ministry here, which took place in the gym, by the way, that maybe 
they could also have hope. He told a story, he starts crying, and there's not a dry eye in our crowd of 20. And he's saying, this is my church that loved my kids through a very difficult time in my life. In his story, fast forward, he was able to mend his marriage and the family became supported by this amazing church. At the end of this conference, this was spoken on the stage. There is nothing like the church when the local church is working right. The local church is God's hope for the world. In that moment, I knew what God was calling me to in my life, not as, as a pastor, per se, but as a follower of Jesus. That if somehow I could be a part of building that, wherever I would worship, wherever I might lead, wherever God would send me, like here at San Ramon Valley United Methodist Church. Sign me up, God. I want to see that type of hope be replicated over and over and over again. And friends, we can see that here. But it's going to take all of us. And I'm only sharing you part one today of this is our aim. Come back for three more parts because I'm going to tell you how. And it's going to be awesome. And we have a great future ahead of us. And the best is yet to come. I hope you believe that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we love this church, and we know you love this church, but we also are reminded today that you love the world, not just this church. You love those that are driving by right now in front of 902 Danville Boulevard, people that may be rushing off to a gathering or to shopping or to whatever their day calls them to. And I believe that some of these people are struggling with despair. Broken lives, broken hearts, broken dreams. And they're driving right by our church that we love. God, help us to a become this beacon of light and hope in this world as we reorient our hearts to this vision re-articulation to set our aim high to pursue a life with you and a life with each other by following Jesus, thriving, communion, healing the world. Breathe your inspiration, your spirit into our hearts so that we can exist not just for ourselves, but for all of the world that you love so very much that you gave your one and only Son, Jesus Christ. Continue to reveal what you have in store for us, who we are and who you are calling us to be in these weeks to come. As we pray this in Jesus' precious name, amen.
Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone, we'll stand side by side. The circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone. Stand side by side. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle. As we move into this time of offering, we are reminded that our giving and our generosity are acts of worship. They reflect God's heart of generosity towards us and declare our trust in God. We are always grateful for the many ways that you faithfully give, through your offerings, tithes, and support for special projects and needs. All of it empowers our church and equips our church to do what God has called us to do, to do life with God do life with each other, and to be healing agents in the world. There are different ways that you can give. You can scan the QR code on the screen. 
Share your gifts in the offering plates that will be passed down the pews. Mail your checks to the church office or give online at www.srvumc.org slash give. Let us now continue to worship as we offer our gifts to our God. Will the ushers now please come forward? Loving Creator, we dedicate these offerings with hearts guided by your wisdom and grace. As we gather on this September Sunday, may our gifts embody the teachings of Proverbs, spreading honor, kindness, and justice to all. Use these offerings to uplift those in need, fostering hope and peace in our community. May we live out your wisdom in our actions and generosity. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, I'm Brad Stribling, and as lay leader for this church, I'd like to share with you a few opportunities. So don't forget the second of three church finance seminars hosted by our finance chair, Jeff Stroying, is today after worship service, 1130 in the fireside room. This is most informative and important, so please come learn how we budget and manage our expenses. The gathering worship service is tonight at 5 p.m. in Wesley Center. Join us for an inspiring worship followed by a delicious fellowship meal. Everyone is welcome. And a reminder, Rise Against Hunger is coming on Sunday, September 22nd in Wesley Center after worship service. We're striving to raise $5,000 to fund the packing of 12,000 meals by 80 participants. We have some open slots, so please sign up to help support this very worthy goal. This is us. 
I'd like to invite Lindsay Horatska to share an important message. Good morning, everyone. So um, I really love the uh, visual of seasons, new seasons, uh, seasons of change. Um, we are embarking upon a new season here at the church, as Pastor Sam has, has mentioned, a new season of deeper connection with God and with each other. Good morning, church. My name is Lindsay Herotska, and I'm here to share some exciting news about an event that's coming next Sunday after service. I represent a small group of people, others, that have been working with uh, under the leadership of Pastor Sam and, of course, Bill Rust, who is our faith development guru here at uh, San Ramon Valley. Um, in fact, if there are any people that are on the small group coordinating team, would you please stand if you're out there? I, I, I saw, there, there's Jane. There's a few of us. Bill, of course. You'll get to know who these people are if you come out next week. And if you've been reading the Valley Messenger, you have undoubtedly seen articles by Bill Rust about this event. And uh, I don't know if you actually said the word this morning, but if you don't already know what I'm talking about, the event I'm talking about, which is coming next week, is called Group Fest 2024 coming to this church next Sunday, September 15th. If you ever wanted to know about all the groups at this church, come out to Group Fest next Sunday. We will have tables and representatives from all the different groups in the Wesley Center. You will see friendly faces and you will get information about all the different groups at this church, so you don't want to miss this opportunity to find out who we are and perhaps where you belong and everything else your church has to offer. As Pastor Sam mentioned today, Group Fest is also going to be the launch of life groups at San Ramon Valley United Methodist Church. We'll all be hearing a lot more about life groups and how they tie in with the church's vision rearticulation that Pastor Sam and the church council have been working on for the last eight months. So with all of this in mind, I want you to have all the information about groups, small groups, and life groups so that when someone comes up to you and says, what's your church all about? You can say with total confidence, well, let me tell you about my church. It all starts one week from today, September 15th, in the Wesley Center, Group Fest 2024. Please come and check it out. And be thinking this week of someone you can invite. Bring them with you. Thanks a lot. And remember our coffee fellowship offered today by the Friday morning coffee group right after worship service today. And now please rise if so inclined and join in singing hymn 577 verses 1, 3, and 4, God of grace and God of glory.
God's people said, Amen. Amen. Friends, it's been a joy, an honor, and a blessing to be together in worship. Thank you so much for being here, lending your heart, your voices, to praise the God who is calling us out into this world. So many people to thank each and every week for making our Sunday experience such a blessing from our amazing welcome team to our hardworking media team to our loving next-gen team to our inspiring worship music team up here. Can we thank them for just the blessing of leading us today? Friends, as you go forth from this place of worship, may you go forth loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength, and loving others in Jesus' name. This is our aim. This is our vision. This is our pursuit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his wonderful and loving face to shine upon you and grant you joy, peace, and purpose in knowing Jesus Christ, our Lord, now and forever. Amen. We muted the instruments.